Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance and now a new section. And this is maybe a big one. This is the discrete forward rate term structure models. Okay, so long name. Maybe uh, another common name for historic reason is that this is the LIBOR market model, where the name is no longer so precise. Yeah, first, I mean, there is no longer uh, a LIBOR rate in the market. Yeah, we move to the backward rate as a replacement. Um, and it appears a little bit as if this model is no longer relevant. But, okay, that is not true. And I would like to remind you of two little things. First, we had this little lemma that the simple forward rate and the backward rate, they have the same value, the same expected value uh, when we are before or on the period start. Okay, so val the value of paying the backward rate at the end of the period agrees with the value of paying the forward rate, the corresponding forward rate at the end of the period. And also very important in a market that is performing collateralization, if I is the index that pays the backward rate at the end of the period, the backward rate obtained from my collateral account, then I just recover the single curve theory. So we recover the single curve theory, which means the forward rates. So remember, forward rate is now more general, just by definition, the value of paying this index divided by the zero copper bond. The forward rate really is given in terms of the zero copper bond prices with the classical single curve formula. Zero copper bond price at the beginning of the period minus at the end of the period divided by zero copper bond at the end of the period divided by the period length. So we really have that this whole single curve uh, setup is still holding in this situation. And such a collateralized market is actually really the standard for interest rate derivatives. So this means a model that models now forward rates is still a very relevant model. And this is what I would like to do here. I would like to model here our forward rate and for historic reasons, I call my discrete forward rate still L. Uh, L may be historically associated with the LIBOR, yeah, but it's just my simple forward rate. So it is L from TI to TI plus one, the forward rate for that period. Well, observed at some observation time, say little, little t. Okay, so it's a stochastic process. And you see, I have many stochastic processes because I have many periods here. So I will have a model for the whole term structure yeah, for many periods. Let me start with um, the model specification, maybe a little bit general formulation, then I discuss a few popular versions. So I consider a time discretization. So this time discretization is discretizing my interest rate curve. Okay. And on this time discretization, I consider now the simple forward rates Li. Li is the forward rate for the period from Ti to Ti plus one. I consider this for I from zero to N minus one. Yeah, so actually I have N forward rates, but usually if the simulation time little t also starts here in T zero and T zero is the 
initial value of my discretization for the uh, forward rates t0, then the first interest rate yeah, is already fixed. So I have only n minus one interest rate that are still stochastic that move like a stochastic process. So we defined this in this definition 142. So that was still the definition when we had single curve set up. Yeah, but recall from here, yeah, that definition, okay, so you can think now of that definition holds in such a collateralized setup, okay, if the forward rate describes the yeah, value of paying the backward rate at the end of the period divided by the zero comma bond. Yeah, okay, so maybe one remark. Um, this represents now a discretization of the interest rate curve. Okay, so my continuum of maturities has been discretized. But note that this will already maybe create a very big model. So consider, for example, that our period discretization is 0.25, yeah? so we have quarterly periods, yeah? so four periods per year. So then Ti plus one minus Ti is 0.25. Then if you consider 20 or 30 years, you already have 80 or 120 different interest rates. And each of these guys here is now a stochastic process of its own, yeah? So I will have maybe a 120 dimensional Ito stochastic process. So even for such a coarse discretization, yeah, it will be a big, big model. On the other hand, you think, okay, maybe you should go to a Heath-Gerald Morton framework where you have a continuum. Uh, uh, on the other hand, that's often not necessary because you do not even observe so much data to fit yeah, all these fine interest rates. So the discrete forward rate model, also historically known as LIBOR market model, models our quantities Li as Ito stochastic processes. So every guy is now in stochastic process for of its own. DLI is mu i dt plus sigma i dw i. Okay, so first observation, every forward rate has its own Brownian driver, possibly. So dw i. So it's not only a 120 dimensional Ito stochastic process, it is also 120 dimensional Brownian motion. Okay, that is driving this stochastic process. I allow here that these Brownian motions have an instantaneous correlation. So dwi, dwj is rho ij dt. So if you ask now for the model parameters, so our model parameters are the coefficient sigma i, the correlation rho ij, and of course the initial value of the stochastic process, so li of zero. So if you have, um, say, 30 years quarterly interest rates, 120 of these guys, okay, then you have here 120 initial values. You have here 120 functions. And here you have 120 times 119 half correlations. Okay, the matrix is symmetric and the diagonal is one. Yeah. So you have a huge number of parameters. Yeah, this is a very high parametric uh, model. And we have later to discuss how we calibrate the model and how we reduce maybe the number of parameters. This here is a very general formulation because I allow that 
the coefficients depend on the L. Yeah? So you could say this is a local uh, volatility model. You could also allow the same here for the rho. Yeah? I just was maybe a bit lazy to, to write this. So you can also put an L here in the rho and could have a correlation smile if you like. You could have this dependency here in the rho as well. Okay. I formulate the model under P, so I'm still here under the objective measure. So, of course, if we change the measure by Gesanov theorem, that will induce a change of drift. So here my drift is now mu superscript P, yeah, the drift under the objective measure. That uh, drift will be part of a separate session where we have to derive the drift. An equivalent form of the model yeah, is that I write it with independent Brownian motions. So here I have a DUK and my Brownian motions UK are now independent ones. So the instantaneous correlation of two different drivers is zero. DUI, DUJ is zero. Um, but now, not everybody gets a different one of these DUKs. And now, I just place here a weighted sum of all these drivers in every equation. So, this is an equivalent form. of this model, where I've just written this part here in a different way. Yeah? So an equivalent form of this 109 is this form where I have written here this part, the part that was previously sigma i, DWI in um, a slightly different form. I will later show that these two are equivalent. Actually, the way how they are equivalent is here below. So the lambda IK is just sigma I times FIK. And the FIK form the DWI out of the independent components. Okay, and how do you get the FIK? Well, the FIK are the vectors that you get if you calculate the Cholesky decomposition of the correlation matrix. Actually, this form here, you don't find it so much in textbooks. Yeah? In textbooks, you often find this form of the model. Okay, so why is this form here a little bit more popular? Uh, it is more popular because the model parameters have a little bit clearer interpretation. Because if you look here, this is just like in a Black-Scholes model for um, a single forward rate. Yeah, in a Black-Scholes model, this guy would be sigma i of t times li, dwi. So this here is the volatility parameter describing how volatile is this object. And this here is the correlation parameter describing a little bit how are the different interest rate connected. These parameters have a nice interpretation, the volatility and uh, correlation. While here, okay, the lambda IK, I call them just sometimes factor loadings. Okay, so what, because they are a little bit the coefficients in front of the drivers, the stochastic drivers, yeah, and you tell, okay, how much from which stochastic drivers enters into Li. Okay, but since the factor loadings are a little bit of fusion uh, of the volatility and correlation, uh, actually related to the Cholesky decomposition of the covariance matrix. Uh, this model is a little bit harder maybe to interpret or the 
parameter lambda i k is a little bit harder to interpret. However, this model in this formulation has an advantage if you consider the computer implementation. Surprisingly, what we will see later, uh, the calculation of mu will be much more efficient if you use this form here. So this is the reason why when I later specify the interface of the model, I will specify the interface that you have to provide lambda ik. But of course, uh, lambda ik can be calculated from the volatility and the correlation parameter. Yeah, this is um, our model. And there are popular yeah, versions of this. Well, the first one is the starting point, okay, the original version of the model, the log normal model. So the log normal forward rate model, original version of the LIBOR market model, this is just that I use here for my volatility function sigma i, which is allowed to depend on L. I just use L i times sigma i, now superscript L of T. Yeah, so this superscript L is just a label. So sigma I superscript L, this is just a deterministic function. So you see that you have a log normal dynamic. Log normal dynamic means that I have an L I D W I there. I still have here the notation that, that this is here under P. Yeah, so you see there is a mu i superscript p here. But uh, later you can see that if we move to q, then the mu i q will be some mu i, let's call it mu i superscript l, okay, just that it is a different symbol, times l i of t. So you see that you also have an L i of t here. Okay, so that means that you can move to the logarithm. Yeah, so you have something like the log L i is some mu i superscript L. Okay, so that it depends on L again. It will be a complicated expression. And then you can have a minus one half sigma i superscript L of t squared dt plus sigma i superscript L of t dwi. Okay, so for this model, you can move to log coordinates then under q. So it means that um, this is a nice model if you would like to model interest rates that cannot become negative. Yeah, so for example, if you have that the initial value is not negative, then all the solution will stay non-negative. Yeah, this was or is still a very popular model that interest rates cannot become negative is maybe a defect of the model because you know negative interest rates can happen. So maybe you could also consider a normal version because what we have here is just the Black-Scholes model, the Black model. For every forward rate i, so n times, uh, so it's n times the Black model. The only difficult question that comes now compared to our session where we had discussed the Black model and the analytic formulas is that I have to look at this model under a single unified measure. So I can choose one numeraire and all the processes will be under the measure corresponding to that numeraire. So I cannot choose a numeraire such that all the mu's become zero. Yeah, negative interest rates could be possible. This model does not allow it. We could move to a normal version, so a normal forward rate model. So this means that now my diffusion is just some sigma 
I superscript N D W I for the forward rate L I and sigma I superscript N is now just a deterministic function. So it can depend on little t, but it does not depend on L anymore. Okay, so I have a normal dynamic and the normal dynamic means that I choose my sigma I L I as sigma I superscript N. So this is just the case where we have a Bachelier model for every forward rate. You see, I also have some small change here in my initial value. So now my initial value is allowed to be negative, but um, the initial value should be larger than minus one divided by delta ti. Okay, so what's that? Uh, recall the definition of the forward rate. Okay, so Li is the bond at the beginning of the period minus the bond at the end of the period divided by the bond at the end of the period divided by the period length. Okay, so you can also write this then as the ratio of the two bonds minus one divided by the period length. So you see that if the forward rate is smaller than minus one divided by the period length, okay, then the forward rate multiplied with the period length, okay, the forward rate multiplied with the period length will be smaller than minus one. Okay, so this means that you know, at minus one, the ratio of these two guys here is negative. So it means that we will observe negative zero Cooper bond prices, never negative forward bonds. And that's actually an arbitrage. Yeah? A negative zero Cooper bond would mean that you get something when you buy the zero Cooper bond, just to have a guarantee that you get something in the future. So that maybe does not make sense. So maybe it's reasonable to assume that my initial value, my forward rate, which I observe, uh, is larger than minus one divided by delta ti by the period length. Yeah, actually, actually, this is a large number. If my period length here is uh, 0.25, yeah, quarterly periods, okay, then this means that the forward rate should be larger than minus 400%. Yeah, so a negative interest rate of 400 minus 400 percent yeah this is a big thing yeah so within the quarter you have lost everything so now this this here is a normal model yeah so this means that actually the model does not guarantee that the forward rate stays above a certain bound so the next version of the model fixes this problem and this version is also you know, very very popular, and it's the displaced log normal forward rate model. So I have a log normal model. So you see there is still log normal in the name. So I have some L here, yeah, but the L is displaced, it is shifted. Okay, so DLI is LI plus DI. Yeah, so DI is now some constant times sigma I DWI. Note that you could write for DLI, DLI plus DI. Because if you differentiate a constant, that is zero. So the differential of Li is the same as the differential of Li plus Di. Yeah? So it's just a parallel shift in, in the values. So this means that you have the model Dli plus Di is, okay, some dt part plus 
Li plus Di Sigma I DWI. So you see that you have the model that this quantity here is log normal. Uh, at least we can later show that in the DT, there's also an Li plus Di popping up under Q. Okay, so actually it's a really a log normal model for a displaced variable. So I have that Li plus Di is log normal. Okay, so you have that Li plus Di, if the initial value is larger than zero, larger or equal zero, then the stochastic process will stay larger or equal zero. So if Li plus Di is larger or equal zero, it means that Li is larger or equal minus Di. So a reasonable lower bound for my initial value is minus di. And I have a guarantee that li stays above this bound. Yeah? So you could now uh, use this to describe some reasonable lower bound for the interest rate. For example, you say that the interest rate cannot fall below minus 3% then you have um, a model that models interest rates. Interest rates can become negative, but they stay above some uh, lower bound. Yeah, that's maybe um, a good generalization and is also um, a very popular model. And the funny thing is also that this model is an interpolation of the previous ones. So our displaced log normal model is an interpolation of our log normal model and the normal model. Okay, so our log normal one was DLI is, okay, some DT, but just look at the diffusion. It is LI Sigma i, okay, superscript L, T, W, i. Our normal one, the Bachelier type model, is a DLI something D, T, Sigma i, superscript N, D, W, i. And for my interpolation, I now have, yeah, now I take an interpolation of the two. So I take maybe alpha times the log normal one. So I have alpha Li sigma i superscript L plus one minus alpha, the normal one. So alpha between zero and one. So a convex combination, sigma i superscript N, dwi, yeah, then you can write this as, okay, so there should be a bracket here, alpha sigma i superscript L times Li plus, okay, I have moved alpha sigma i superscript L in front. So I have to divide by this again. So this is one minus alpha divided by alpha times sigma i superscript N divided by sigma i superscript L dwi. And this guy here is now my displacement. This is my di. Okay, And this here is my volatility of the displaced forward rate. So this is my Sigma i superscript d. So you see that you can also inter interpret this displaced uh, model yeah, with some adjusted volatility like an interpolation. So what we have is alpha equal to 1. So alpha equal to one corresponds to the fact that this guy here is zero. Alpha equal to one corresponds to the model where we have no displacement. 
no displacement is the alpha equal to one, the log normal case, and alpha goes to zero, yeah, or equal to zero, corresponds to di going to infinity, yeah? So infinity means I have no lower bound. The forward rate stays above minus infinity. So I move to the normal one. So this is then the normal model. So the displacement is really interpolating between the two models. You also see that the sigma parameters here, you have to be a little bit careful. They have different interpretations. Yeah, Think, for example, that the interest rate is 1%. Then if this sigma here is say 20%, what you have here is a 1% times 20%. Yeah? So it is a 0 0.01 times a 0 0.2. So it is a 0 0.0002. Yeah? So if you would like to have a similar coefficient here, uh, you would have a much smaller normal volatility. And for the displacement, yeah, it's maybe similar. You see that there is um, some 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 scaling, some scaling go going on. So you have to be careful that these parameters in front they have maybe different scaling interpretations. So now we saw three very nice versions. And all these versions were just a modification of our diffusion function. Yeah, so I did not discuss much the correlations. Yeah. This is also something that we should take for our implementation. When we implement the model, I will start with a very general implementation that allows here very general forms of the coefficient lambda or in the other formulation of the coefficient sigma so that I have one implementation that allows me to create all these three popular versions of the model yeah, by just small modifications. Actually, you already see if you implement the displaced model, because of this interpolation property here, you have implemented versions of the log normal and normal. The coefficients that we had so far are just deterministic uh, functions. Yeah, So my sigma i superscript L or the sigma i superscript N or D for the displaced model, my rho, yeah, they are just deterministic functions. This general form, which we had, where the sigma i is a deterministic function two, but may depend on the L, this is called local volatility function. Because you see here, these coefficients are just deterministic functions, but here the coefficient is a random variable. Because it is a function of L, yeah, it can become a random variable. Yeah? So sigma i superscript L times L, uh, the whole thing is a random variable. So this guy is already stochastic, but it is in a certain sense not completely stochastic because the stochasticity is generated by just um, a function of L. So the resulting coefficient is a random variable. Whoops. So the resulting coefficient is a random variable, but it has just a dependency on L. The dependency could be um, complex. Our mu will be some uh, adaptive pro process, which will turn out to be actually a function of L and the sigma i. We can also generalize this part here and allow just another ETO process. So not a function of L, just another ETO process as parameter sigma. This is then called a stochastic volatility model. Yeah, So the volatility is stochastic. So 
also here the volatility is stochastic, but it's stochastic in a special sense that it's a function of the other variables. Okay, so I already made this remark. Yeah, a motivation for this model is a little bit that it has a very strong connection to our classical models, the Black Scholes model, the Black model, or the Bachelier model. So if you go back to our log normal version, so our log normal version represents a log normal forward rate model. So it represents just the Black model for every forward rate. So we have the Black model here, the same for the normal version, which gives me the Bachelier model. And so somehow it's a very natural uh, generalizations. For example, you already know if you just have a caplet on that single forward rate, we already know an analytic formula. So if we just take this model where all the forward rates are now stochastic processes, if I just look at a single caplet, I would have an analytic formula for the caplet value because this is just a black model on the corresponding forward rate. I could switch to the corresponding zero Cooper bond as numeraire equivalent martingale measure and value the caplet. So if we change the measure, yeah, such that Li is drift free, we immediately know the terminal distribution of Li, and we could value a caplet. These models are just starting points, yeah, for further generalization. Yeah, generalization, whenever we meet uh, need them, um, so. One generalization, I already did it for didactical reasons. So I already did that when we discussed the black model. One generalization was that our volatility is time dependent. So our sigma i parameter is time dependent. Another generalization that we have here is that now I have multiple forward rates and we model the correlation between the forward rates. Okay, so that um, already appeared a little bit when we looked, for example, to the quanto, where we had two stochastic processes, the interest rate and the FX forward. And I need to specify the correlation of the two quantities and the quanto adjustment dependent was dependent on this. So for evaluations of uh, swaptions, the correlation will play a role because a swaption is an option on a swap and the swap pays multiple forward rates. So I have an option on a sum of these. So it matters yeah, if all these forward rates move simultaneously which is somehow maybe increasing the volatility of the swap rate, or if they move uncorrelated or even anti-correlated, so they neutralize maybe each other in their movement, which will reduce the volatility of the swap rate. So for a swap chain, it's maybe intuitive that the correlation of the forward rate is significant. Recall now I have only models for the forward rate. When we value the swaption, I did a little trick. Yeah? I just wrote down a model for the swap rate. Here we see there is a question behind this. What is the relation of the stochastic process of a swap rate when I know the stochastic processes of the individual components? We have to discuss this a bit later. Then the next generalization would be to step away from my local volatility function. So local volatility function means that my sigma is just a function of L, like for the displaced model. Yeah, it already became a little bit more complicated function. Instead for the stochastic volatility model, 
so the next generalization, I model the sigma by just another stochastic process. So just another stochastic process that has now a Brownian motion as a driver that is not part in the L. Yeah, So I cannot represent the sigma i as a, as, um, a function of the L. The, it has its own stochastic driver and maybe it also has some kind of path dependency or whatever. Yeah? So it could be very complicated. I already studied stochastic volatility for equity models in a different uh, lecture. Yeah, so um, those who have seen this, followed this, uh, maybe know that stochastic volatility is a nice tool to introduce a volatility smile, but also already the displacement uh, is a, a nice uh, tool to very easily introduce an implied uh, volatility smile. So that the, said, uh, our equation, yeah, say 110 for the black model, could be seen as the starting point for the modeling. So our general form with the local volatility covers already a very large family of models. What I have left open is that I need to specify the drift. The derivation of the drift that will come in the next session, yeah, so maybe we do that next session, uh, holds for the most general version, yeah, so for the most general version, holds also here for the stochastic volatility model. So I will sometimes just write sigma i uh, or lambda i k uh, without paying attention, is it a local volatility function? Which local volatility function is it? Or is it um, a stochastic volatility function? So these derivations, which we do here, uh, hold also for the very general model. Um, and historically, the log normal one and normal one are just... Um, nice starting points, yeah, but they are very well understood. We have analytic formulas and so on. Another remark, we just model discrete forward rates. So if you like to draw our discretization, say for example, this here is Ti, Ti plus one, and so on. Okay, then you can observe forward rates, LJ, okay, so these guys. Okay, so you can observe these guys here. And this is now what we model as a stochastic process. Okay, so these guys move up or down, maybe a bit independently, yeah? depending on the correlation, maybe each guy has its own volatility function, sigma i could also have its own independent Brownian driver. You know that I can calculate of these also the forward rates for longer periods. So I can also calculate from ti to tk. So say from here to here, yeah, so well, maybe let's let's span it here. Okay, so this is now my TK. This guy is my TI. Okay, this here is my TJ to TJ plus one. Yeah, you can calculate this because you know it's maybe just uh, the construction of the forward bond, or you just see that one plus Lj times delta Tj, this is just the ratio of the bond at the beginning divided by the bond at the end of the period. And then if you take the product over these, it's like a telescope product. It is just the bond at the beginning of the period. Okay, so let's maybe call this guy T1 
Ti, okay, then it's the bond at the beginning of the period, Ti, divided by the bond at the end of all the periods, Tk, yeah? So I can calculate the long forward rate from Ti to Tk by taking the product over one plus the small periods over the individual period that lie in between, uh, then minus one divided by the whole period length. The reason is that I observe all these zero copper bond prices here for these maturities, right? I observe all these for these maturities. Yeah, well, now comes a little bit um, a problem. So what does it mean? So observed, observed in TI. Okay, so observed in TI means if I am, say, here in TI, okay, then I can ask, okay, uh, how much interest do I get over this period if I invest in over this period? So this means here observed in TI. Yeah, what about observing a zero copper bond price at a point in between? From the forward rate, it's not a problem. Yeah, I observe all these interest rates here. I observe these interest rates also in between. Because this is what my model is describing. It's describing the forward rate for all times little t. The problem is that I cannot observe this zero copper bond in little t because for this zero copper bond I would need the forward rate from here to here. It is the bond that matures in tk that is observed in little t. So this guy is observed in little t. So for this guy I would need the zero copper bond that pays from here to here, okay? And then I can multiply with all the other accruals, yeah? One plus forward rate times period length to get the zero copper bond that goes from here to TK, yeah? So this is maybe a little bit the question. Okay, what is the forward one that goes from here to TK? So maybe I draw this guy with a brown color. The bond that goes from little t to TK. Uh, so this guy, so what is this guy here? Okay, and the problem is that the bond that matures at the end of the period, given that I'm in the middle of the period, is missing in the model, yeah? So T is in the middle of the period. This object is missing in the model. So my model can describe all these forward rates and it can describe zero copper bonds, but only the zero copper bonds observed when I'm on the discretization point. This is a problem, and this is a problem which we will discuss later, and this guy is called the short period bond, and maybe we can conclude. So we have two tasks in the next session. We have to derive the drift. So what is the mu i under q? So for all i with a given numerea, so I can choose one numerea for all forward rates. And I have to discuss what is this thing with this short period bond, yeah, that is missing in my model. Yeah, so the model appears to have a gap. That was it for today.
Thanks.